like a start off our portion of the show by giving you a taste of a little something we call Rock and Roll! 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 All right, welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast. I'm Don DiMuccio, and today is the all-drummers edition of It's Only Rock and Roll. Later on in the show, we'll be talking to a man who made up the backbone of Billy Joel's band, touring and recording with the Piano Man from 1974 to 2004, and has now written about those 30 years in his memoir, Liberty, Life, Billy, and the Pursuit of Happiness, one of my drumming heroes, Liberty DeVito. This week's guest spent 30 years as the ever-solid, always innovative drummer for Billy Joel, playing on recordings that took him to the top of the charts, around the world on countless tours, and earned him his rightful place in the pantheon of rock's greatest drummers. And now his newly released memoir entitled Liberty, Life Billy in the Pursuit of Happiness details those experiences and sets the record straight on a career that's truly unmatched in rock and roll. Please welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast, Liberty DeVito. Thanks, Don. Great to be here. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate you doing it. Yeah. Where you at? I am out of Rhode Island. Rhode Island. You got that, uh, you know, the podcast. Well, that's accent. it. I had somebody on a couple of weeks ago ask me what country I was from. I said New England. So <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of the United States. It's all, you go, you know, a couple of feet out of your hometown, you hear somebody else talking a different way. Exactly right. I love it. I'm also a drummer. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah, I've been stopping ever since. And I blame you, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, you and Ringo. And, you know, like the rest of the world, you I know you're a big Beatle fan and you were inspired by Ringo, but talk as if you're talking to some 15-year-old kid who has no idea what we're talking about. Tell me what that experience was like seeing them and getting inspired. Oh, well, it was February 1964. The President of the United States was just killed in November. We were uh, the new generation that had nowhere to go. I mean... Elvis was the older generation's uh, a star, music star. So when they showed up on uh, the Ed Sullivan show, they because they came from Liverpool, England, where nobody really knew where that was, they, they could have come from Mars because they talked different, they looked different, and they were actually um, just recycling black music that we weren't allowed to listen to as white kids in the United States. Right. And all of a sudden, this was brand new stuff to us. They kind of like just blew the whole country away. So sure. it was a relief. It was it was a relief from the, the, the president being shot. And we were in a new year. And this was like, okay, this is going to be good. Tell me how that made you want to play the drums. Well, because when I, you know, I write this all in a book. When I was in uh, the, the sixth grade, my parents bought me a set of drums. They bought it for my cousin. I didn't ask for drums or anything like that. I always loved music. But I didn't ask for drums. And uh, all of a sudden, drums show up. And I asked my father later on in life, why did you get me drums? And he said, because they didn't make Prozac when you were a kid. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so uh, the drums were in my life. Yeah. But in sixth grade, when I went to join the school band, I couldn't do the buzz roll and the Star Spangled Banner. And they put me on the bass drum, which was a horror show. And so I got very frustrated. You know, didn't lose my interest in music. Always loved music. But kind of the drums, I thought, oh, man, my dream is going to be killed. Then when the Beatles came on the Ed Sullivan show, I, I pointed at the TV and I said, I want to do that. Uh, I, don't, I don't care about the buzz roll. This stuff's yeah, right, better. Right. That's what I want to do. And what was that first kit? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, it was like a, a, a leady uh, oh, yeah. nice. kit uh, with like a 26 inch bass drum. Really? And yeah, and, and it had a, like a, a canoe going down a river on the front. You know the 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 tom heads were were you know tacked to the bottom. Oh, one yeah. of those. Yeah. You know, I wish I still had it. It'd be worth a fortune. Probably Zildjian A's. Yeah. Right. Like, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. One of your first professional gigs was working with Mitch Ryder. Well, that was insane. It was um, you know I was eighteen years old. Like I graduated high school in June, and this was now November. 
I, I had played first with, with the Detroit Wheels. Mitch had split from the Wheels. And they came to town looking for a drummer. And I had been jamming with Vinnie Martell from the Vanilla Fudge. Oh, yeah. Behind the Fudge's management company. So the, the Detroit Wheels went to that management company, which is called Breakout Management. And they said, we're looking for a new drummer. Johnny B is leaving the band. So they said, do you know anybody that's good? And and somebody in the office said, there's a kid in the back that jams with Vinny. He's pretty good. You know, so they come out to my house and they they had become a blues band by then. They were barely playing any Mitch's songs. And there was only one guy left from Mitch's uh, original band, which, who was the bass player. Okay. So uh, they had a, a singer uh, named Rusty Day who later went on to play with Cactus, uh, with Carmine's band Cactus. Yep. He stayed at my house a bunch of times, and, and I stayed. At, I went and stayed at his house when the Detroit Wheels uh, traveled across country. So my parents were very fond of him. Uh, he used to come over to eat when he was rehearsing with Cactus. And one day he said, look, I'm going to look for a gig for you. Always practice. Don't embarrass me when you get the call. <laughs> so when I got the call... The guy on the other end of the phone said, uh, uh, Rusty Day said, you're good. Um, can you play with us? And it was Mitch Ryder's tour manager. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I said, when do you want me? And they said, tonight. I said, how about tomorrow night? I don't have a driver's license yet. My father has to drive me into the city. Oh, I mean, you were young. You were that young. Yeah. Yeah, very young. What year are we talking? 68. 68. And now how long did you stay with them? Well, at the time, the reason why I got that gig was because uh, his drummer, who was Johnny Siomas, who went on to do Frampton Comes Alive, he got very sick. Yeah. And so I was with him for like six weeks up and down the East Coast, uh, playing colleges all the way up and down the East Coast from, yep. from Maine to Miami. And then Johnny got better and he came back. But right after that, that that whole thing split up. So it was uh, six weeks. Uh, it, w- it was like going to school for six weeks, learning how to play rock and roll with a real Detroit rock and roll hitter. That's a great experience. Yeah. Now, after that, you were playing in the local New York, Long Island club scene, and you knew Billy Joel like a good, what, seven years before you actually ended up working with him? Oh, time. yeah. I was I was 17 playing in a club on Long Island, and Billy was in a band called The Hassles. I was in a band called The New Rock Workshop, and we used to uh, play in the same club, you know, pass each other in the dock and say hi, you know, and I admired him. I thought he was really good, and yep. he thought I was good. So we knew about each other before we actually played together. What kind of stuff was he doing back then? Was it top 40 stuff of the time or was it? Oh, yeah. Well, at the time, uh, it was, this was the time of the vanilla fudge. Okay. You know, when yep. they were doing, uh, copies and remakes of, uh, other songs. And most of them were like, uh, Motown songs and R&B songs. Keep me hanging uh, on. Yeah. They did keep me hanging on. My, uh, band, the New Rock Workshop did You Got Me Humming by Sam and Dave. So did Billy's band, The Hassles. You know, we were doing a lot of stuff like that, knock on wood, kind of R&B things, doing them with a little psychedelic edge to them. Well, I know on his early albums, Piano Man, Street Life Serenade, he was using, I think, Ronnie Tut. Yes. And on the first album, I think he had Denny Sidewell from yeah, Wings. He, he did. How did you yeah. get in the lineup, and how did that whole thing come together? Well, when he was out in California, you know, he was using the Studio Cats in the in the uh, in the sessions, and then going out with a different band on the road. He got Doug Stegmeyer in his band. Doug Stegmeyer was in a band called Topper with me. He was in the band with Topper with me, Russell Javers, and Howard Emerson. Now Doug went out on the Street Life tour for the for the album Street Life Serenade. Right. And on that tour, Billy told him. I want to move back to New York. I want you to stay with me, Doug. And I want the same band that goes in the studio with me to go on the road with me. And I want a New York style drummer. And Doug looked at him and said, you know, the guy he was talking about me. Yeah. So when I auditioned for him, I had already been hanging around, you know, uh, of course, obviously with Doug. Billy's tour manager at the time was Brian Ruggles, still a good friend of Billy's. And I was hanging out with him. Uh, and we became very close. And so I was kind of in as far as friendship and hanging out with the guys before they, I even played musically, you know. So you had a rapport already with these guys. I did. I had yeah. a rapport already. When I went for the audition, Brian was the one that was going to give the thumbs up or the thumbs down. <laughs> so <laughs> I was in. Yeah. And then we went in to record Turnstiles, the first album I played on. And um, we, it was just me, Doug, and Billy in the studio. 
And then Billy said, I need guitars to play on this tune, like, like Miami 2017 or something like that. Mm. And me and Doug said, well, we know guitar players. And we got Russell Javers and Howie Emerson. And so the whole Topper band eventually became Billy Joel's band oh, with the addition of Richie Cannata. That's great. And tell me about those early sessions. Like, What, what, what strikes you when you think back of the turnstile sessions? Well, when I look back at the turnstile sessions, I think about this beautiful pearl set of drums that oh. Billy had bought me right after your audition. Oh. Uh, you know, he was playing Elvis at the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 He said, what do you need? I said, uh, um, how about a new set of drums? You know, because I was using this this mixed match set of Ludwigs. He said, okay, let's go. We went to Frank Wolf on 48th Street in Manhattan yeah. and b- bought this. this uh, it, was, it was 8, 10, 12, 13, and 16 floor. Nice. Pearl, fiberglass, thin shells. And I knew about them because Steve Gadd, I had seen them once before. Uh, and I- I'm telling you, they sounded so great. They really sounded great. Those are the drums that are on Turnstiles and The Stranger. Well, man, they do sound great. I mean, right from the opening salvo of the album with uh, Say Goodbye to Hollywood. Yeah. There's a story behind how you get that galloping kind of clapping sound with the angry <laughs> young man. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, Billy, uh, we were listening back to the track, and in the verses, Billy Billy was saying, you know, I want this kind of, um, this this uh, this uh, galloping kind of horse thing, you know, and he's banging on his chest, he's banging, and I said, you want that exact sound? He said, yeah. Took him out in the studio, put up two folding chairs, laid him down, and I played that part on his chest. <laughs> but, awesome. you know, to brighten it up, we I did it on brushes, too. Uh, that's a great. <laughs> that's the innovation I'm talking about, and you know, when I introduced you. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I think some musicians may be too afraid to step yeah. out of the box. Yeah, well, we stepped out of the box a lot doing things. Uh, there's a great story in the book about a stiletto. Uh, you know, it goes that da dun dun, and it has the snap. Uh, well, I, we were testing out different snaps. Okay. And it rained that day when I came into the studio. And I had this great umbrella that you pressed a button and it came out and it went snap, you know. It was really good. So they set up the microphones and I'm, I, and they were getting a sound on it. And I keep pressing the button and snap, snap, you know. I did it for about a dozen times, you know. And then they said, okay, we're ready to roll. Here we go. I pressed the button and the, and the top of the umbrella just came flying right off. Of course. Of course it did. <laughs> <laughs> After what a half hour getting sounds for it, and then yeah, that's it. half hour getting sounds. Right. Uh, but I, I, I know that they for um, you may be right. I think they broke at least twelve panes of glass to get that one right one. <laughs> now the stranger was the huge breakout album, and I know you've given a lot of credit to Phil Ramone. Yes. Now Billy was at one point talking to George Martin about producing that. Yeah, he was. <laughs> um, George, <laughs> Sir George, Sir George, yeah, uh, came, <laughs> wonderful man, uh, came to see us play. And we were all excited about it. After the show, Billy met with him and, and came back. And we said, well, what, do you th- what did George think? And he said, he wants to produce me. And we were like, that's great, man. Yeah, but he wants to use studio musicians. Yeah. So that's when Billy said, uh, love me, love my band, and said no to George Martin. And um, then Phil Ramone was the next in line. He was a staff producer with uh, Columbia Records at the time. Right. And he came to see us at uh, Carnegie Hall, and um, he met with us right after the show at the Howard Johnson's down the block where we were staying. He said, I, I want you guys in the studio to be the rock and roll animals that you are on stage. That's cool. You, you know, yeah. but he just he showed us how to hone it in, you know, like just bring it in. Was he a taskmaster? Was he someone who demanded take after take after take like a Phil Spector? Or was he more just get it live and do it once and get that original spirit? Oh, Phil, Phil went for the feel. That was, Phil went for the feel. You know, in, in the studio, it was said, uh, if you're going to make a mistake, play it loud because it might be the best thing you'd play all day. That's nice. So, you know, it was yeah. like uh, w- Phil would sit behind the board and we'd be playing and doing a take and he'd go, you know, make a couple of changes. And if, if he stood up, that means the take was was good. So keep going. And then if he started to move, yep. that was it. You knew that was it. You know, even if the record sped up a bit, slowed down a bit, th- that was the beauty of, of, of the way we used to record. There was no, uh, what do you call it, quantizing. Right. There was none of that. You didn't play to a click? Uh, a couple of times I did. I remember when the, we did The Stranger, they had the click in the board. And 
I, I was like, oh no, not a click. And Steve Kahn, who was playing guitar at the time, he looked at me and he said, the click is your friend. <laughs> you <know? laughs> we actually used the click to set the perfect tempo for the song. Right. Because as, as the song went on, you know, I like to go from a verse into a chorus and just give that little edge of, of you know, play in front of the beat then. You right. speed it up a little bit. Right. And if the song wasn't, if it wasn't the take, and the song got faster by the end, we always had that click to go back to that original tempo. Because usually when you start recording the, the next take, if there's no click to go refer to, you start at the tempo that you ended at. Right. You know, yep. so that the, the click was a safety net. A couple of times, we, the click went all the way through. I think I'm running on ice. The click went all the way through. Uh, just a couple of songs. When I was eight years old in 1979, I remember spending hours playing along to my eight track of the stranger trying to learn that <laughs> opening fill you do right before the verse of only the good die young tell oh, yeah. me about how all that came about because i know there's a great story behind that well see if you were as old as i am and you had bought the access boldest love album by Jimi hendrix uh, you would have heard that same fill on uh up from the skies by mitch mitchell yeah <laughs> I just want to talk to you I want to do you no harm I just want to know about your different lives I live to see if people fall you know, Yeah, that was originally written as a reggae song. You know, we were trying it, beat it to death in the studio. Yeah. <clears throat> and I told Billy, I said, dude, the closest you've ever come to Jamaica is on the Long Island Railroad. There's a stop at Jamaica, New York, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and, uh, and so I said, no, let, let's, let's try this. Let's make it swing. And it, it was sitting really well when yep. it was swinging like right. that. And I thought, well, I got it to swing. Why don't I do that Mitch Mitchell beginning? You know, if Mitch was alive, I'd probably owe him money. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's funny. On, on Still Rock and Roll of Me, you know, I break into that straight four fill. Right. You know, and Alan White did that on uh, uh, Instant Karma. That's All why right. I heard that. And I went up to Alan at a NAM show and I said, you know, Alan, I got that uh, that straight four fill from, from you playing it on Instant Karma. And he just put his hand out like he wanted funny. <laughs> <laughs> I read what you said in Rolling Stone that you've been called a songwriter's drummer. That's just so true because you play to the song as good as someone like John Bonham or yeah. Keith Moon or Neil Peart, bless them all. They were giving the song Big Shot and then giving the song Rosalinda's Eyes. I don't know if they would be as versatile. Right. I think my versatility came. Uh, see, my education was was not uh, going to a studio and sitting with a drum teacher. My education came from listening to records. My education came from people that I knew that loved music, that didn't even play an instrument. They would turn me on to different kinds of music all the time. But my big shot came when I played weddings, believe it or not. Oh. A friend of mine, he got me in this wedding band. I did not want to do it. He lent me his tux. He lent me the bow tie, the whole thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. He says, you're going. I already told him you're coming. Uh, it was in a catering hall. So I felt like I got a, an offer that I couldn't refuse. So I, I went to this thing. I'm driving there thinking like, wow, I played with Mitch Ryder. What am I doing playing weddings? I, I'm, I'm destroying my career. It's over. You know, but I got there and when the, uh, uh, the, the trumpet player, they, these are all old guys too, very, very old, you know, like at least three times my age. Sure. And, um, so. The, the trumpet player turned around and says, uh, the bride wants to start with a merengue. And I went, what the hell is a merengue? <laughs> I played those weddings for two and a half years, and I learned more there than anywhere else. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, because sure. you had to play ethnic music. Right. You know, you know uh, uh, my Yiddish mama, you know, the tarantelle, <laughs> right. uh, all, all that kind of stuff. So when I got in the studio with Billy and it came to Just the Way You Are, it was easy to pick up a brush and a stick. Because right. I played Bossa Novas at weddings, uh, you know? Yep. Yeah. And my favorite album, Glass Houses. Don't ask That's me why. Favorite. What a great tune. I don't think there's a snare hit in the whole song. There's not. As a matter of fact, there's no bass drum in it either. It, that, that boom, huh. boom. It's a floor tom. Really? I, pl I played that with, with a shaker and a floor tom. See, that? I call that courageous. No, people might think that's crazy, but... You yeah. know, I don't know. If I was given that song, I'd be like, well, I got to play the snare. I got to do the, this. Gotta get, there's no hi-hat. Very few drummers do that. I mean, Ringo on the song Something, there's no hi-hat in it. 
Right, there's no hi hat in it. And uh, I was listening to a song on the radio yesterday that Ringo did. Um, I'm looking through you, and there's a tap, and he's tapping on the on a paper cup. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, at the time they didn't have those emulators. You couldn't emulate things on a keyboard. Right. You had to do it there. You right. know. I could get off on a tangent about computers and how the whole music scene is destroyed because of it. And yeah. It's too easy today. You don't have to be creative. You don't have to look for ways of doing things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you develop your own style when, you, when you're, um, you know, just looking in the room for something to hit. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, it becomes your own thing. I just did a track. I, I play this charity event every year, but this year it's been canceled because of the, the virus. Of course. And, um, the, but the band over the internet is getting together to play Walk This Way, right? Yep. So I, I had to record it the other day in the studio. I had to record to the guitar track that the guitar player did and the vocal track. And I did something so different than the record. You know, like uh, during the line, mm -hmm. uh, I played it uh, like halftime, almost like hip hop kind of thing. Okay. And, uh, when they when the producer called me, he said, "I love this," and he said these words. He said, "It's so Liberty DeVito." <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I can see that. Tell me any memories about glass houses. Any any specific things stand out in your mind when you were recording? Well, the, the great thing about glass houses is we we recorded. Maybe you may be right. Uh, sometimes a fantasy, and maybe one other song, and then we went on the road. And we did those songs in the tour uh, during the show, okay. and just to see the reaction what the people would feel, you know, with the, how they would react to the yeah. new songs yeah. before they actually heard them, you know. And the reaction was great, and Billy knew that this was going to be big. And uh, it was. That was a good album, great album. And right around that time, you also did some work on Karen Carpenter's one and only solo album. Now, did Phil Ramone get you involved in that? Yes, he did. It was at the same time in the same studio with the same musicians. <laughs> ah. And why do you think A&M refused to release it at the time? Well, because um, her brother was afraid uh, that they were going to lose their audience. You know, they were real like uh, apple pie and, uh, oh, yeah. you know, uh, big smiles and all that kind of stuff. And she's singing stuff about making love in the afternoon and, and things like that. You know, she's she's coming of age. She She's like, you know, I'm old enough to be able to sing this stuff. And this is what's happening in my life now. But her brother didn't want it to happen. So he put it on the shelf and it stood there for 10 years. Yeah, what a shame because it's cool. I mean, she might have got an entirely new audience. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's well, the, that's the lesson learned from you guys is that you didn't stick to one style, right? And the Beatles never stuck to one style either. I mean that's, that's no, you know it's funny. I have to do a, a thing for the Beatles channel on Sirius Radio tonight. I was I was going through the songs like you know what what songs will I play? And um, your mother should know uh, came through. Yeah, and um, oh no, six, when I'm sixty four, and I can remember when that album came out. I was seventeen years old listening to the whole album and then when i'm 64 comes on and you're like laughing because it's like these guys are so good they can do anything and you'll love it yep you, you know sure <laughs> i mean going from lovely rita or getting better to when i'm 64 i was like oh my god I that's know. so great or from you an, know? actually from an indian raga is <laughs> yeah. really yeah. yes and yes I, that's insane Yes, That's why and I, I don't know too many people that picked up the needle and pa passed it over. You no, know? no. I don't want to dwell on the negative stuff. But, but. I, but, I, <laughs> but I do want to mention, um, I know Billy got ripped off by his manager, the former brother-in-law, and yeah. there was a big lawsuit in 89, and I, I'd heard that the relationship business-wise kind of changed around that point. Yes, it did. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, well, um, you know, he lost a lot, Billy. Uh, I mean, the guy... There was a lot of money missing, let's put it that way, that Billy thought he had. And um, so in order to recoup, and Billy said this himself, he felt like he was uh, Peter stealing from Paul. But, um, you know, we were getting bonuses on the records, on the albums. Yep. He asked for that to stop. He said, I, I can't do that anymore. We were getting percentage of the, of, of the uh, gross when we played uh, arenas. Right. And he said, I can't do that. I have to put you on a salary now. You know, so he did everything he possibly could to keep Billy Joel and this unit together. Mm -hmm. But it did take taking some things from us that uh, we were getting at the time. Right. Do you remember what your last gig with Billy was? Last date? 
Oh, yeah. It was uh, 2003 at the Brendan Byrne Arena in New Jersey, I believe. Did you feel something was happening in the air? Or? No. No? No I, no. I was totally blindsided by what happened. <laughs> But, you know, I should have known because uh, Billy likes to change. I mean, I played with him for 40 years. So so for, say, like 45 years, uh, I mean, uh, 35 years or more, he had had, a, you know, went from piano man to street life, then made a major change coming to New York with turnstiles, and then changed and did Stranger, which was a pop album, and then 52nd Street, which had more jazz influence, and then Glass Houses was rock. So he constantly was changing. I was the only thing in 30 years that he didn't change. You know? <laughs> right, right. It's a good run. It was a great run. I, my kids went to school. We all ate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it still hurts. Can oh, yeah. Because we were friends. Right. You know? And now the great thing is is that we have that friendship back again. I read you guys had breakfast together and sat together and, yep. and talked. And, and it was all over something ridiculous and stupid. Stupid, yes. And I'm like, yes. And I, I won't ask you what it is. The only thing is, like, you never got the chance to refute whatever he thought it was, you know, all this time. Well, well, here's the deal. What, what happened is uh, Billy Joel is surrounded by so many people. I mean, there's the other uh, band members, there's the road crew, there's management. There's, there's so many people that he trusts to do their jobs. So he's trusting them. So if he hears something that somebody said that I said or did, right. um, He's like thinking like, okay, I could, I trust this guy and I believe what this guy is saying. But his mistake was he didn't come to me and ask me if I did that That's or said it. that. And my mistake was I didn't stand out in front of his house and wait until he pulled out with his car and stopped him and said, what happened? Right. You know, I let my uh, Sicilian blood get the best of me and he let his Billy Joel get the best of him. Right. Like, forget about him. I don't care about him. You know, mm. it was that kind of thing. I'll show him. You know, band members die, unfortunately. Musicians get yeah. accidents. And it, it didn't come to that. You guys got to work it out. So that's cool. Well, that was the thing. You know, it was like uh, you're laying in bed and you're thinking, wow, life is short. And so many people are, are, are dying around you and, you know, friends. And, and you hear about it all the time. Uh, who's dying? You know, just this week it was Peter Green and, and uh, Regis Philbin. Yeah. You know, yep. all, like, oh, my goodness. You I know? know. I know. You must be so proudly your body of work one kick-ass song after the other but is there any track that you hear whether on the radio or that you say to yourself man i wish you could go back in the studio and take another crack at that well i wish we never did my life <laughs> really yeah Hi. I, I don't i don't like that song so much that uh, we were when we were playing with elton doing the billy elton thing uh we were rehearsing uh, my life and uh, we're playing it and elton stops playing and he looks at billy and he goes and he points at me and he goes he's not playing it right and Billy, look, <laughs> Billy looks at Elton and goes, he's not going to play it right. He thinks this song sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the one, huh? Yeah. Not crazy about that song. And tell me real quick about the Lords of 52nd Street. Lords of 52nd Street. Ah, uh, yes. We were inducted into the Long Island Music Hall of Fame as the Billy Joel Band. Yep. Uh, myself, Richie Cannata, Russell Javers, and the late Doug Stegmaier. Now, I was still upset about what happened with me and Billy, and I said, I'm not going, you know. Um, but uh, I talked to the guys, and I went, okay, I'll go. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was so upset about it, I sent somebody else to do the sound check. I said, you go. I'm not going to do the sound check. <laughs> but we got there, and um, they asked us to play one song. The crowd reaction was so great, we ended up playing four or five songs. And after that, we thought, well, you know, it's really funny – all these people in tribute bands are making tons of money playing uh, Billy Joel stuff in the tribute band. We're the real guys. Why don't we do it? There you go. You know? Yeah. So as we were rehearsing and as we are starting to tour and stuff like that, I'm falling in love with the songs again. And all I can think about is how much fun it was to do them in the studio and how much fun it was to go on the road. The only thing now that was missing was the guy that I used, I looked at for 30 years, you know, right. every song. We looked at each other's eyes just, you know, because to see how it felt, to nudge your head, to, sh to look at that girl in the front row, you know, right. whatever it was. Right. You know, and in the studio, you know, uh, going through the songs and, you know, uh, having an opinion about everything, you know. So that guy was missing and I wanted that guy back. Yeah. That was my friend. Sure. You know. Sure. So he was the only thing missing, and so I reached out to him. 
you know, and, and luckily the next day he wrote back, you know, so it was good. All right. Best gig, worst gig. And I think I know what the best one's going to be. Uh, I had to guess the Soviet Union gig. Yes. Yes. The Soviet Union was a highlight in those 30 years to go to a place where, you know, uh, remembering that you hit on the desks when you were a kid because you thought they were going to destroy you right. and, and meeting these people that were just beautiful, just fantastic, just couldn't give you anything but their hearts, you know, because they had nothing. They right. had absolutely nothing and they couldn't believe that we went there to play for them. That was definitely a trip. Worst gig, I would say had to be what we had a stage at one time where you walked into the arena and all the equipment was underneath the, the stage right it was on hydraulics and um you know, the monitors went to the stage hung under the stage so the guitar player had to stand on top of the grating to hear his guitar all right yeah during the first song everything's supposed to come up pianos drums well the drums did not come up oh. <laughs> <laughs> You know what that's like? Being under the stage, banging away at a first tune, huh. and having Billy at the time, because it was uh, uh, No Man's Land from the River of Dreams tour, yeah. he's got a guitar around his neck, you know, faking it. Right, right. He's leaning over this hole, looking down at me, <laughs> laughing, just laughing. It was such a spinal tap uh, moment. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was many, embarrassing, but funny. How many songs until you finally popped up? Well, at the end of the song, just like the Spinal Tap, oh, when he opens geez. up that thing, the, 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 oh, I, I finally popped up. Oh, I wish that was on video. <laughs> <laughs> Some live Billy Joel right there featuring the great Liberty DeVito doing his best Hal Blaine impression. And we want to thank him for spending some time with us on the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast. And remember, his new autobiography, Liberty, Life, Billy, and the Pursuit of Happiness, is available at HudsonMusic.com and, of course, at Amazon.com.